Well, good morning. How many of you are as much of a hot mess as I am right now? <laughs> you know what? I'd trade all kinds of stuff for just moments like that with Jesus. There's nothing like it. Uh, it's a life-changing thing whenever the Lord just kind of opens the eyes of your understanding and kind of gives you some kind of a hint of what uh, His kingdom's all about. And we began that last song, or just something about the the majesty of God that uh, has done so much with just a spoken word, and yet he was speaking words into you today that will have exactly the same effect if you respond the way the universe did. What he says, he does. Plain and simple. He's just looking for a yes. Just a yes. That's not the message, but maybe it is. The Lord's not supposed to mess up my agenda. See, that's, that's the thing. Hey, <clears throat> you know what? Easter's next week. Newsflash. And uh, we still need some folks to help us with the candy hunt. We're going to be welcoming kids and uh, big kids from all over the area uh, next Saturday morning, and we really could use some more help. Uh, to give hospitality to all those folks and make sure uh, everything goes well. And uh, if you would be willing to volunteer just for that short period of time, uh, we would really appreciate if you stop by the info desk out front or go online and volunteer. Uh, we want to put our best foot forward to the community because this is the time of year when lots of folks that never darken the door of a church end up in church. And uh, our mission is to reach people. And one of the ways we do that is through the, the front door of our eyes and, our, and, and our, our mouth as we speak to them, as we welcome them, as we show hospitality. You know, hospitality is a big thing in the Scripture. And uh, a lot of the rewards that people would receive in terms of help in, in the future of their lives and so forth had to do with showing hospitality uh, for the name of the Lord. So we would love it if every one of us felt like a greeter, every one of us felt like uh, a person that was authorized to show goodness and grace to, to folks that come through these doors. So we would appreciate you helping us with that, and uh, it's going to be great. We're looking forward to the day. Uh, today, uh, oh, by the way, Friday afternoon at noon, we'll have our annual uh, Good Friday service. And if you didn't know that, uh, or you didn't know how that works, you actually can get off of work legally uh, to be part of that for an hour. Just will last an hour. We're going to have communion together. We're going to share just a few minutes and pray and, and do all the things that, that matter um, on a day like that. And we'd love for you to come. It is kind of a special time for us, Christmas Eve and, and, um, and Good Friday are kind of like special moments just to kind of get together and and uh, revel in what the Lord's done. So uh, we'd love to have you here. It's always really a sweet time. So please plan to do that. We'll look forward to seeing you there. Today I, I want to share something that really is right in line with where worship w was today. I couldn't believe it when Charity started uh, talking along those lines because I, I was seeking the Lord about what to share as I do every week. And then Saturday I kind of, I, I sat down with a blank sheet of paper and uh, wait on the Lord to, to share with me what he once said here. And uh, a lot of people say, well, that's crazy to wait till Saturday. I agree. I totally agree. Uh, I, don't, I don't like the plan. I really wish I had six months of it laid out before me so I could relax. But honestly, it's kind of one of those moments where, you know, you, does anybody here just have a meeting time with the Lord where you just say, I'm, I'm, I'm yours today. That's my Saturday. And uh, sometimes Friday as well. But uh, it just is important to me to hear what he's saying. I know what I like to say, but how many of you know what I have to say and what he has to say probably are different. And uh, I'm excited about the Lord doing some things in us that we can attribute to nothing else. <laughs> Unless you've been there, you haven't, you haven't lived yet. So what I want to talk to you about today is a single word that cropped into my mind yesterday morning as I began to really feel the heart of Jesus for, for the day. And uh, I never preached a message on incongruity, but that's the word. Um, this coming week, we and much of the world around us will be more conscious of the crucifixion of Jesus and its implications. 
than at any other time of the year. Yet in many respects, while worship activities are likely to ramp up, it is also equally likely, likely that lots of sinful behavior will continue unabated. The point is, that even though we may resolve in our better moments to abandon bad behavior, we all have tendencies to fail in ways that contradict what we deeply believe or desire. Therein lies the incongruity we experience deep in our nature as humans. This descriptive term describes someone or something with qualities or features that seem to conflict with one another, according to Merriam-Webster. The same source illustrates the concept by referring to a sailor that doesn't know how to swim. With these these few minutes today, I would like to concentrate on the painfully illustrated incongruity of the first disciples. That, in all honesty, still relentlessly plagues us today. The silver lining in this cloud, however, is that Jesus was not surprised by it, and use the occasion to instruct those early believers, as well as those of us who would come later, about both the pitfalls and the promises of the days ahead. The passages we're looking at today took place at the Passover. Jesus was sharing his last evening on earth with his disciples before he was to undergo crucifixion and a very brutal death. As the discussion unfolded, Jesus pulled back the curtains on the weakness of human nature, He predicted something that would occur that very night which would give his disciples, present and future, an appropriate perspective on their potential for failure as well as the available resources to overcome it or even avoid it. The events and promises of that fateful evening transformed the lives of those 12 men. All but one followed the Lord and excelled in living for him for the rest of their lives. The other man? Well, let's just say his short-sighted withdrawal from Jesus and his subsequent betrayal quickly led to the tragic end of his life, fueled by suicidal regret. Both the 11 and the 1 teach us valuable lessons. Hopefully, we can be wise and follow the majority in this case. The following are just a few of the many possible observations of these passages that could help us do just that. So if you'll turn with me today in your device or your, or your Bible. How many of you actually have a Bible? I'm just curious. There's a lot of Christians here. <laughs> That's awesome. We can cancel that Bible page turning app that I ordered this week. So, Number one. Be aware that personal ambitions, even the, quote, godly ones, can overshadow some very crucial information the Lord is trying to get across. I want you to get with me here for a moment. The world's going crazy in Jerusalem. They're trying to find ways to to kill Jesus. There's a lot going on. The the disciples sense the the foot beats behind them. They're being watched. They're being judged. The religious machine is going crazy. And here they sit with Jesus in an upper room having the Passover, something they've been doing since they were kids. But on this night, it is all different. But the intrigue between the disciples themselves is playing out because they have this continual thing that they seem to do as they walk along the roads or as they sit together. There seems to be this sense of who's the greatest. I wish I could say that since that day, that's never happened in church. But so many of us can't enjoy the giftings of other people because we're so concerned about how ours are being received. The green-eyed monster lives in modern-day Christendom. Jealousy, personal ambition, it just crops up. And some people can't come to church or can't even worship the Lord without comparing themselves among themselves. The scripture says they are not wise in so doing. 
verses 14 through 24 of uh, uh, Luke chapter 22, we, we begin to see this. But I'm going to concentrate on 23 and 24 just for time's sake today. It says, then they begin to question among themselves which of them would do this thing. Because Jesus had just announced to them that the traitor that would betray him was at the table with them. And in the very next verse, now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them would be considered the greatest. Look at the dichotomy here. We got, we got some guys trying to figure out who's going to be the traitor and who's the greatest. They're sitting in the presence of Jesus who is conducting the last official Passover. And they're trying to figure out who's who in the zoo. I'm sure there were many ideas that were forwarded about who it would be, many little niggling conflicts between people that live together, travel together, and eat from the same uh, table, and now they're trying to figure out who's the traitor and who's the king when the king is sitting right in front of them. I wonder how often that goes on. There's something about understanding in whose presence we've come to be. And when we understand that, all the other stuff begins to slot in in their present order. And we get that out of order. Egocentricity, folks, will always draw you into deception. When you're the center of the universe rather than the one who created it, everything's out of whack. That's a good theological term, isn't it? Out of whack. I don't know where it came from. I don't know what it means, but I, it sounds right. But they were concerning themselves with those matters. And, and, and at the same table with them was the creator of everything. So be aware that sometimes, even though he's with us, we're more cognizant of what he's going to do for us or do to us than we are with who it is that we're in the presence of can get very, very selfish at times like that. Secondly, greatness is spelled S-E-R-V-A-N-T-H-O-O-D. Jesus understood what they were thinking without them saying it. And he turns the paradigm of worldly leadership upside down and says, listen, you all want to be the top dog and have everybody bow and scrape to you, but let me just tell you what. Greatness in my kingdom looks like. The one that's greatest among you, he's going to serve everybody. Ooh. Verses 25 through 30 tell a story that we need to hear over and over again. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, the, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and, as he who, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Obviously, in their culture, it was he who sits at the table. Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet, I am among you as one who serves. He just washed their feet. He did the job of the lowest slave of the house. But you were those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed one on me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He's saying to them, you have authority here. It's an amazing thing I'm doing for you, but I want you to understand that the way up is down in my kingdom. If you're too good to serve, you're too good to rule. That's a new paradigm for us, but it's a paradigm of the kingdom. Number three, we have no idea what we're up against. I'm pretty sure who the leading candidate, at least in Peter's own mind, was for the Greatest Disciple Award. Just a few points on his resume really overshadowed the rest of the field. For instance, he was the first to declare Jesus as the Messiah. 
Second, he was given the keys to the kingdom. Third, he was invited to be on Transfiguration Mountain with only two other guys, and Jesus and the Father. And finally, he was the only disciple to ever walk on water, albeit temporarily. Peter had no rivals, yet the Lord draws him out and says, Peter, in in essence, you don't know what you're up against, buddy. With elevation in my kingdom comes a threat from the other kingdom. There's no place for arrogance. There's no place for thinking you're above it. There's only a place to be on your knees in gratitude to the one who's rescued you from it. We have no reason to doubt that he was, as far as he knew, absolutely committed, motivated, and passionate to his very core. However, Jesus purposefully introduces him to the fact that as awesome as his resume and his good intentions might be, his pride in his abilities and status were not going to be sufficient to prevent failure. Luke twenty two thirty one. 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, by the way, he went away from the name that he had given Peter back to his original name which means he's speaking to the lower nature, the humanity that he was born with. Simon, Simon. He's talking right down to his soul now. Simon. Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you like wheat. This is one thing we don't quite grasp. You know, when you get an electrical appliance, it has a UL on it, usually, because it's been tested before it could be utilized. Can I just tell you, God always tests what he builds. Because an untested person that's talented and gifted and even gifted by God untested, may rise to great heights and great influence, but that which was not tested will probably be his downfall when it's most important. The enemy desires to test every one of us. Not God, God doesn't always grant him that. I read the book of Job and I'm saying, whoa, Job didn't ask for that. He was doing it right. And one day, Satan appeared before God, and he has to report, believe me. He reported to God, and the Lord says, have you considered my servant Job? And he gave him accolades. I'm thinking to myself, if I'm, if I'm Job, I'm going, no, 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 no. <laughs> and it went south in a hurry. God limited it. You can't go past this. And the enemy kept encroaching and saying, well, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. And the Lord gave in and said, you okay, test it. At the end of the day, Job wins. But believe me, the day was long and arduous and difficult and costly. But see, God, God judges things from eternity's perspective, not your 10-year period. It may hurt bad for 10 years or five years or 10 minutes or whatever it is, but God tests what he builds. And he says, Peter, he's desired to sift you like wheat. He's going to shake you until everything settles out. We're going to find out what's in you. He's going to sift it. God says, okay. Peter cannot believe what he's hearing. Number four, listen to this. I love this. We heard this today already. Jesus' prayer reveals a redemptive compassion for someone who has fallen and a plan for their return from failure. Thankfully, there are a number of things that are salvageable from our dance with death. 
that can result in an increased awareness on several fronts. Number one, a more realistic view of ourself. Some of us think we could not and would never. And God says, uh, 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 don't get ahead of yourself. Secondly, our vulnerability to evil influence and failure. We can't imagine. Thirdly, the deep agony of an unguarded moment and what it can bring. Next, a new appreciation for grace. The desire to help others avoid falling. A deep desire to help them recover if they do. And an increased vigilance against self-assured risk-taking. You know what this says to us? You need God and you need Him bad. Don't think that your track record of good works and never messing up and always making the right decisions and always being a good Christian and all that are any assurance that at any moment in time, unguarded or guarded, you could be swept into a place where the temptations and the deceptions of the enemy would cost you dearly. But understand something. Jesus said, I'm praying for you. He still does. The Bible says he ever lives to make intercession for us according to the will of God. And the will of God is you get through this trial. And that you come out without the smell of smoke. His idea is that you understand deeply that everybody is temptable as long as they're breathing. And that we must keep ourselves in a humble posture before God. Kneeling before the Lord in your heart, if not in your body, is the most appropriate place for us to live. Arrogance, pride, and all the rest of that go before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I've heard so many sermons over the years, and I'm afraid I've preached a few, that were more haughty than humble. They wanted to compliment us and pat us on the back for what we don't do. We don't smoke and we don't chew and we don't run with girls that do. <laughs> Though we have the most wicked heart in town. Religion is ugly. It's death dealing. And it separates us from the ones we need the most. It's not a servant's heart. And God says, I need to break you of your pharisaical nonsense. And the best way to do that is to let you have a good dose of what it feels like to be a sinner again. I'm not recommending it, nor was Jesus. But there's some things you only find out by doing. I would, as I said many times, I'd rather read your book than follow your example in some things. But the bottom line is, folks, Jesus is not in any way, shape, or form deceived by our ability to be spiritual. And he's warning Peter. And Peter's not buying it because Peter can't even fathom the fact that what Jesus is saying is real. I'm convinced that successful recovery from failure often ignites the desire to reach out to others who have failed or are about to. Going through a chapter of unnecessary pain due to bad choices is likely to etch an imprint deeply into our being. What I'm talking about here is the brokenness that comes from seeing how far and how fast we can fall. Again, I'm not recommending that you take this journey, but at some level, most people have taken the journey and some people have a frequent flyer card. But I'm just saying... Rather than getting comfortable with the fact that we fall, let's learn from those things and be watchmen on the wall, not only about ourselves, but about those we love. Good counsel comes from those who have walked a mile or two in those shoes. I would like to encourage you today. Some of us make memorials out of the positive things in our life, but some of us need to have a few battle badges on our uniform. The stories of where we went on our own and the rescue attempts that Jesus undertook to get us back. 
help everybody. I'm not saying wear all your dirty laundry out on, on your sleeve, but I am saying there are certain things in your life that you went through and you got a, a battle badge. Like in the army, you, you go through a particular conflict, you get a, a patch or a, or a medal or something to go along with that. And I'm saying that some of those places you've been that you don't ever want to go again are badges of courage. They're understandings that you couldn't have gotten any other way. And I love what Jesus said to Peter. He said, when you return to me, strengthen your brothers. Whew. Jesus has confidence in his prayers. He's not afraid. He's not afraid that his grace is not sufficient. He just hopes you get out of it before the scars turn to permanent wounds. He's given grace for us to turn at any given moment. It's never too early to repent. Everything starts with a thought. And then it's compounded by a word and then action. You could stop at any point along the way and learn something. Learn something because everything starts that way. We need to understand when we can cap it off. We don't have to go for the full Monty, if you know what I'm saying. We can cap it off. We can see that we've gone the wrong way when just one step instead of six or eight or ten you don't have to live down there. You can stop at any time, and you can return with a testimony. I heard a quote attributed to John Maxwell some years ago that goes along these lines. When you fail, at least fail forward. And while you're down there, pick up something you can use when you get back up. Lesson learned through failure can get very expensive. What a wise person takes away from those experiences can be an absolute lifeline to many. This is one way that the enemy meant for evil. This is one, one way that what the enemy meant for evil, God can turn for good. Folks, Luke twenty two thirty two. let's read it. Jesus said, I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you've returned to me, strengthen your brethren. This, this is such an powerful thing. It's such an empowering thing for us to remember. That when we get down that road somewhere, there is a return. I was told to you today and around this altar. It's so important that we don't let the enemy say, you've committed the unpardonable sin before you committed the unpardonable sin. It's a torment that so many people face. It kills their prayers. It kills their hunger because they think it's too late. The enemy wants you to think it's too late, so you'll give up. I'm here to tell you today that his grace is bigger than you think it is. Don't abuse it. Don't, don't ever abuse it because it's the most precious thing on the planet. But understand, it is durable goods. Understand he's not under any compulsion that we're not a mess. Sin and death were introduced by Eve and Adam and it has been running rampant ever since. When you look at the world around us today, the insanity that is now called wisdom, the immorality that's now called sophisticated, the rank stupidity that even our own government is undertaking on a daily basis. I can't even fathom it. But it's all because man said, I will do as I please. I divorced himself from the God of the universe like a kite taking off and breaking its string. We have spiraled out of control, except for those who have humbled themselves, bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and said, I surrender, like we sang.
Number five, <clears throat> pride and even our spiritual zeal can bind us, blind us, pardon me, to the vulnerability of our lower nature. Peter felt deeply that he was ready to go to prison or even die for Jesus. I might say that dying for him might be easier than living for him in some cases. Because it's over. Jesus pointed out just how vulnerable and headed for failure he really was. He simply could not envision himself in the scenario Jesus was describing. I always think about that, that passage in, in Romans 7 where Paul is saying, what I don't want to do, I do. And what I want to do, I don't do. What a wretched man that I am. Who is going to deliver me from this body of death? That phrase, body of death, I've shared this so many times. Please forgive me if you've heard it, but it was a phrase everybody understood. The body of death was a capital form of punishment. It had two derivations. The first was if you kill somebody, they would chain you to that person's body and leave you. Second was that they would bind you in a burial garment with that person face to face and bury you. That's called the body of death. Paul says, this thing stinks. I have such disdain for this guy in here. He wants stuff he shouldn't want. He says things he shouldn't say. He understands, but he's got incongruity issues. He wants this, but he can't find a way to be this. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who is going to deliver me from this? And he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. And he goes into Romans 8. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Folks, there is liberty. There is liberty. He comes to cut the burial garments, to break the chains off of us and say, come with me. Just like he said to Lazarus, come forth. He came out with burial garments on. He smelled like death. I don't know how he got out. I guess it was kind of like this. I'm not sure how that worked. But he got out. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Loose him. I'm telling you, he's saying that over you and over me today. He's saying, loose him and let him go. This is not who you are. You were that. I called you out of there. Let's get these burial garments off of you and get you clothed in robes of righteousness. For my name's sake. You cannot do it for yourself. But you can say yes to he who will do it for you. <clears throat> Peter, I know you think you got it together, buddy. I'll tell you something. Before the rooster wakes us up in the morning, you will deny me three times. I don't have time to go there, but in the Middle Eastern culture still to this day, to say something three times makes it legally enforceable. One time... Two times, three times. That's the deal. Peter is shocked. Peter is shocked. The zeal, his pride, his dedication, and even adrenaline. Why do I say adrenaline? Wouldn't be very long, out maybe an hour, hour and a half after this event, they're arresting Jesus on Gethsemane. They came with clubs and they came with the, the, the temple guard. They came with weapons to fight a war. And Peter, remembering what Jesus said and what he declared about himself, whips out suicidally a sword. 
And John 18, 20 says he, he made a pass. And Malchus, the high priest's servant, missed the head, sliced off an ear. And Jesus says, enough of that. Picks up the ear, sticks it back on Malchus and heals him. <laughs> so much for your adrenaline, Peter. Thanks so much. You know, they're not enough. When it all comes down, we can go from hero to zero in a heartbeat. You can read the scripture passages to support what I'm saying. Number seven, in John's account of the same event, Jesus unveils the plan that will provide the resources we must have. We must have if we're going to survive the inevitable temptations which, low, which our lower nature is so vulnerable. John 14, 16 through 31, powerful passage of Scripture that, that we need to avail ourselves of and we need to read it because these are the last instructions Jesus gives the disciples prior to his crucifixion. He's telling them what's coming. He's telling them what the, what the antidote for the problem is. The essence of his plan is to release the same Holy Spirit that empowered him. The same Holy Spirit that rested above the Ark of the Covenant all those years. The same power of God that was ensconced in his own body without limit. That caused him to be able to do all the things he did. He says, that Holy Spirit, that same one that raised me from the dead shall now be quickening your mortal body. You shall be recipient of the same thing. No wonder the devil wants to keep you and me from getting very cozy with the Holy Spirit. Religion treats him like the weird uncle. We got to keep him in the back room. He'll embarrass us. Let me tell you something. He needs to be in the living room. He's your only connection. Your zeal, your ambition... Your pride in your spirituality, even your adrenaline, are of no use to God. Jesus would under no compunctions that even he could go so low. He said, I only say what I hear my father say, and I can only do what I see him do. We're copycats, folks. Nothing's original with us. It belongs to him, and he's very willing to share. The essence of his plan was to release the same Holy Spirit that empowered him to fill our innermost being. This will essentially change our operating system and equip us to desire and to understand the life that he gives. The word Jesus used to describe what the Father was going to release is the Greek word parakletos. It's a compound word. Now listen to this. Made up of parak, which means to finish or to save, to end, to finish or save. And the word lita, which means the curse. The effective translation of the parakletos is the redeemer that ends the curse. What curse? The curse of the law of sin and death. The one that brought death to mankind. The one that causes me to say no to God when I really want to say yes to God. It's a cultural thing. It's part of the normalcy of humanity today to be evil. But the Spirit of God comes and says, I am going to replace your hard drive. You're going to begin to love the things I love and hate the things I hate. I'm going to redeem you from the curse of the law. And if we think somehow we're going to do that, I got news for you. You do not have the software or the hardware to make that work. The Holy Spirit of God has come to replace our operating system. He's come to process what is coming from heaven and put it into our mind, put it into our desires, begin to work in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is the most liberating, fascinating, powerful thing on the planet And folks in my denomination said, well, he was done after the day 
But Jesus died. When we got the Bible, the Holy Spirit was no longer necessary. We feel things, yes, but no, 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 no. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said, has been with you. In those passages, they're in your notes, has been with you. Well, that didn't work out so well. Because all men were condemned under sin. But he shall be in you. On board. Online. On the job. If you're born again this morning, that is the token evidence of your salvation. His Holy Spirit, the same one, that resurrected Jesus, the same one that allowed him to call Lazarus from the tomb, the same one who hovered over the face of the deep when God's word was spoken into it and said, let there be light. He prepared for that reception and he prepares today for the receiving of God's word into us and the activation of what he has said. If the universe that has no will could, could, could obey him, believe me, you and I can as well. We are made for the presence of God. Used to be a little tract that I gave out when I was living in California that had a little man with a Jesus shaped hole in his chest. And he was trying to stuff all kind of other things in there to fill that up. But there's only one thing, only one thing that really completes you it's the gift of salvation. And the conveyance of the Holy Spirit of all the kingdom of God that he wants you to experience. Would you stand with me?